Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Getting laid off from a job can be a horrible thing, but Scott, for you, it wasn't that bad. What happened? Yeah, so I was a regular W-2 uh, employee and had been with the company for about three years. And uh, things were going really well from you know my standpoint and the company standpoint. But as we grew, you know, that brought in new management. They felt a different way and decided ultimately to lay off a number of staff, including myself. And it was a little bit shock at first, but uh, I had been building up a portfolio over the years. So really, for me, it wasn't that big of a deal at the end of the day. Scott was pretty smart. While he was working full time, he was buying rental properties on the side And when he got laid off, he took a look at his numbers and he saw that after his tenants paid rent and he paid his mortgages and all of his other expenses, he was profiting $30,000 a month and realized he really didn't need to work if he didn't want to. So he never looked for a new job. On the podcast today, we're going to figure out how Scott built his portfolio. We'll see what he's buying. We'll take a look at one of his deals and take a look at his entire portfolio and go over all the numbers. Joining us on the show today from South Carolina is Scott Williams. We'll take a quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll talk to Scott. As a rental property owner, you know that things are going to break from time to time. Things like the dishwasher, the refrigerator, maybe you'll have a leaking pipe, whatever it is. I want to let you know about a cost-effective way that I've been using to protect myself from big repair bills. It's Armadillo. Armadillo covers the cost of repairs and replacements for when your systems and appliances break down. My favorite part of Armadillo is that when something comes up, I can use my own repair person and Armadillo will pay me back over Venmo. Or I can use one of their vetted pros to handle the repair quickly. It's very affordable. Plans start at just $29.99 per month. And you can customize your plan to cover everything you need. Armadillo has a special offer just for our listeners. You can take 10% off your plan by going to armadillo.one slash RIP. That's armadillo, A-R-M-A-D-I-L-L-O dot one dot O-N-E slash R-I-P. That's armadillo dot one slash R-I-P. It's a lot of work to find a really good rental property. And when you actually find that property, you want to make sure you're working with a lender that can get that loan closed. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender, and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of loan programs, and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you're ready to get started today, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com, NMLS 42056. Rental Income Podcast. Scott, you found a a niche that really seems to be working great for you. Tell me what you're doing. Yeah, so um, I focus on the affordable housing niche. Um, I like it for a variety of reasons, and it's worked really well for me. The first thing that I think is important with this type of housing is it's an easy barrier to entry. Uh, Typically, these properties are a lot cheaper to purchase versus maybe a, you know, higher class property. And for me, that was always, uh, you know, a good starting point because the hardest part of real estate investing is getting started. So having it be a lot less and more affordable to even purchase was something that allowed me to obviously start taking action and buying. Um, but that's really the the area I've been focusing on. I haven't uh, skewed too far off of it. So with affordable housing, it, 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 so this isn't like a really bad neighborhood, right? Like what what are the neighborhoods like? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I would say C class, so it's not terrible. I mean, I, I go to these properties, so, um, I feel comfortable enough that, you know, I'll stop by and see what's going on. Okay. You know, you definitely run into some issues, but it's not, um, it's not, you know, it's not like a, a war zone going on, anything like that. Is there a certain type of property that, that you're buying? So I really hone in on the price point is like 
you know, I know how much they can rent on a bedroom count. So I really am honing in on the property, the price of it, and really what it's going to take to get it to a point where I can rent it out for what I know I can rent it out. All right. So, so give me, give me a range, like say for your, your average rent, what, 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 yeah. what are you looking at? So I'm in a few different markets. So it really depends on the market. Um, one of the markets I'm in, you know, a, a one bedroom, let's say rents for about nine. I know I can rent it for about 900, eight to 900. Okay. A t- you know, a two bedroom, I know I can rent for 1100 to 1300 and then, you know, so on. Okay. So say for the 1100 two bedroom, yep. like what, what would you want to pay for that? So generally, uh, and again, on a, I, I don't get super caught up on the purchase price because, you know, for me, uh, some money's better than no money. So, I mean, I would say it ranges. I've usually, if you break it out by a price per unit on a, uh, rental of 1100, anywhere from 45 to $60,000 for that each unit okay. is really, the, you know, okay. So now those oftentimes will need work to get them to rent for that much, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I could purchase it and I know exactly what to do to get it rented out. All right. So say, can you give us an example of, of a property that you bought and then maybe what you had to put into it to get it ready to go? Yeah. Um, the latest property I bought was a three bedroom house. It had a tenant already in it. Um, we did an inspection. It needed a little bit of work. It, this was a cash purchase. So uh, I ended up paying, I think it was about 55,000, which is a, a great deal for a single family home. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's in the city of Columbia, South Carolina, which has a lot going on. And I know the neighborhood really well because I have properties all around it. Um, I ended up purchasing it. Uh, a month later, the person living there moved out. We came in, put in about uh, probably five to eight thousand dollars, including labor and parts. Uh, and I just rented it out for fifteen twenty-five. Nice! So, wow! Great! Yeah! Yeah! Now, how are you finding those deals? I, I hear from people all the time that they have a hard time finding deals. H- how are you finding yeah. deals like that? Yeah, it's definitely gotten tougher to find good deals. Uh, what's worked well for me is I've identified a market that I really like, and so. I, for example, have been buying in Columbia, South Carolina for the past two years. I've bought a lot of properties there. So the uh, agents, the wholesalers, they know me, uh, they know my track record. So they, a lot of times will bring me deals before they post them. Um, But, you know, it took me some credibility and some time to get to that point, but I've picked off a lot of properties just on Zillow as well. So there's definitely deals out there. Now you have to just identify the market, I would say, like, you know, I, I own properties in Arizona. Those those are not where I'd be buying right now because it's really expensive for what the rents are. Okay, so um, so you narrowed in on a market, and then once you have that market, so say for the example of Columbia, South Carolina, like you figured out that was an area that you wanted to invest in, and then right. did you drill drill down even further to look at specific neighborhoods that you like or parts of town? Yeah. I mean, I, I do have, uh, properties there kind of all over and I've gotten to learn the different areas. Um, I'm really, uh, you know, at this point I'm more centralizing the purchases in like a kind of a a radius just to help with maintenance and my, my team to make it so they're not going so far out. But, um, I really just look at honestly the price because I know at the end of the day, the price that I purchased for is really what's going to make the money, Mm -hmm. you know, cash flow. So, uh, it just so happens there are certain areas that are within that price range that I'm buying for. Okay. And that's kind of where I've just bought, you know, a lot. All right. So your strategy is find a, a, an area that you're comfortable with, with affordable housing. You're looking for cheaper properties where, where the, the properties are fairly cheap, but yeah. the rents are pretty high. Yeah, I would say, um, and now they've gotten, they've increased over the years. But when I first started buying in, in Columbia, for example, I really researched different markets within South and North Carolina. And that one stood out as the most potential for what I specialize in. The other markets, they just were too expensive for the rent price. Mm-hmm. And my priority is cash flow. It's not appreciation. I'm not turning around selling these. These are buy and hold uh, really for cash flow every month is what yeah. I'm, I'm focused on. Are your tenants mainly Section 8 or do you have mainly cash paying tenants? It's a variety. So I will uh, work with uh, Housing Choice Section 8 voucher residents. Um, 
you know, I have a good relationship with all the different housing authorities we work with. We take care of our properties. So, um, you know, I will definitely take on pretty much anyone, to be honest. I mean, we definitely will screen them, mm-hmm. but, um, it's, it's a mix just depending on, you know, who, who applies basically and wh- who we qualify. Do you prefer one over the other? Um, I mean, it, I will say the one thing that's nice about section eight housing choice, uh, is, you know, there is the guaranteed rent, uh, portion, which is nice. Um, and that comes with its downsides because you have to make sure the units are up to standards and codes and they, you know, there's inspections and there's definitely delays with timelines, but, um, it is guaranteed rent. Now, whether I prefer one or the other, I, I mean, it, I don't, I, I just want people to pay. So yeah. I, mean, I prefer okay. <laughs> that yeah. we get paid, but right. Uh, that's all that matters. You know. Right. Yeah. That's all that really matters. Yeah. All right. L- l- let's talk about your portfolio. How many rentals do you have? So I'm about 125. I'm currently purchasing seven more right now. So there's probably about 130 by next month. Okay. And y- you mentioned they're in South Carolina and Arizona. Yeah. So I have a uh, one property in California, which is the first one I bought, which is San Francisco. That's kind of an anomaly. It's not obviously probably affordable housing, but the other markets uh, are Arizona, a uh, suburb of Phoenix, and then uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Why do you have them in two different areas? So for me, like when I first really got uh, started investing, I honed in on an area where I had a mentor and he was able to show us uh, the ropes on what he does. And so we just started buying uh, in that city, which is Mesa, Arizona, and um, just focused completely there because the prices were good. Uh, We tested the model with one property. It worked well. And then it just, you know, my goal was just to buy as much as I could as quickly as I could while the prices were low and interest rates were low. Yeah. And, you know, then uh, that market got really expensive to where the numbers just didn't make sense. So I started looking elsewhere. When you were buying in Arizona, were you at that same price point, like around 50, 60? Yeah. Yeah. So when, uh, when I was buying, this was about 2016, the price per unit was in that 50 to 60,000 range. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was picking up four plexes for 250 to 300,000, um, and then turning around, renting them for about $900 a month, uh, each unit okay. at the, at the time. Now they've since almost doubled since then in rent. Wow. So, yeah. It's wow. It's so the prices. <laughs> with, with the doubling, does that, ever, I, I know you said you're a cash flow investor, you're not buying for appreciation, but you've seen tremendous appreciation. Does that ever tempt you to maybe maybe sell some of those properties and maybe buy more in South Carolina where it's cheaper. So when I say double, I meant the rents have doubled. Okay. Um, okay. Those two bedrooms that I was renting for 900 rent for 1700 now. Oh, um, wow. Okay. But, but the, the, the prices, prices they haven't kept I mean, up or no, no, they've uh, tripled. So the prices oh. are 750, 800 now for those same, you know, those same four, four plexes. Wow. Um, but for me again, my, my mission and purpose was this was always to have uh, cash flow so that I can do what I want to do in my life and not if I just sold it and yeah, you know, great. I have a bunch of money sitting in an account that I have to a pay tax on and B, I mean, at some point it could run out. This was really built for yeah. ideally the rest of my life and for my kids, you know, when they get older, if they want to be involved. So, and it, it served you well. I mean, so when, when you lost your job, you had this rental income. So, was it not stressful at all when you got laid off? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it was the first time I'd been laid off and, you know, I had a, a good career and always, you know, did a good job from my opinion and from how the company, uh, companies I worked for did, but it was definitely a shock at first. And, uh, you know, but after about, a, it was, I, I actually got laid off right before I went on a vacation and after about a day or two, I was like, this was the best thing that ever happened. Cause yeah. I would have never left. I would have kept working because it's, you know, it's comfortable and, and all that, but it's been so nice just, you know, doing my own thing and, uh, controlling my own right. you know, company with how I want to run it and everything. Are you managing the properties yourself or do you have a manager? Yes. So, um, I self-manage with a team of people. Um, so we, again, we're managing all in house here and, uh, that's a lot of my time is spent, you know, running the operations making sure it's going the way I want it going and, and all of that. 
So 125 rentals, like that seems like there's probably a lot going on. I'm sure you've always got people moving in and moving out and repair stuff happening every day. D- does it feel overwhelming or, or feel like there's a lot to do? Yes. So there's definitely a lot going on. I mean, at that level, you know, every day there's something new or just stuff to do. Um, however, I've been very systematic in hiring people to help with things that are better spent with someone else doing. Um, I'm very involved and understand, you know, every tenant we have and the situation at each property. So I'm really in tune with what's going on and obviously understanding the problems we're having so that we can optimize our operations and making sure we're automating things and just doing things as efficiently as possible because it at the end of the day will help me just have more freedom and sure. lifestyle. Now you live in South Carolina. Your rentals are in, I guess you've got the local rentals, but that you've also got Arizona and yep. you mentioned you were in California uh, initially yep. where you bought that first property. Did you ever live in Arizona or was that always... Yeah, always I kind mean, of remote. I was always remote. So, and I, I feel like it was best because the thing was, I was always wanting to buy when I lived in California and I was looking all around me and trying to find a deal for five years. And, um, it, if I had bought something really close to me, it would have trained my brain that I felt like I have to be close to my property so that I can drive by. Yeah. It's honestly been better that the property was so far that it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Otherwise, it would have probably uh, inhibited me from purchasing things if I had actually seen the property in the area because, you know, pictures are a lot different than what you see in person. Uh, Yeah, you know, I I think that's like a big hurdle to get over because you're absolutely right. It it doesn't matter where your rentals are. It's not going to be any different to manage a property, whether it's down the street or whether it's, you know, a thousand miles away. So like, how right. did, did you ever like have any hangups that uh, I've got to be close by or I've, I've no. got to find this <laughs> rental nearby? I, no, I, I mean, I think when I moved out to South Carolina, I, I thought, Hey, you know what? I haven't looked at the Carolinas market um, because I, after Arizona got really expensive and I, I was saving up a lot of money. I, I thought I have to find something else and it's hard to reinvent, you know, a system in a new place with no contacts and no understanding, but I did some analysis on different cities and honed in on Columbia and the numbers look good. So I tested it out. And for me, again, even I, I live an, about an hour from Columbia. I try to avoid even going there, at, you know, as it is, even though it's only an hour away right. because it's, it's kind of a hassle for me to drive and just when I can re- manage everything remotely. So yeah. it wasn't a hold up at all. Um, it was yeah. actually better again. It just for what my lifestyle I'm, I'm trying to create I feel like if I was closer, then it would give me an excuse to drive around more and just find things to do, which I don't want to do. Right. Well, was it hard to learn the neighborhoods, like to, to learn where you were going to invest? Even though like you're living in South Carolina, I mean, you hadn't been in the state for all that long. Like, was it hard yeah. to figure out where, where to invest? Yeah, um, definitely. I would say yes and no, because a lot when you're dealing with affordable housing, um, it's you know, again, you're not buying a very expensive piece of property where, you know, if things go wrong, you're, you could get hosed. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I have bought a property in, in Arizona, for example, I had bought properties all over the place. I had 14 fourplexes in different parts of the city. Now I bought this one that there was a lot more issues with homeless people and drug addicts and gang bangers that I ended up selling. I just, it was too much for me to deal with. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I, I learned over time a little bit, but generally it's all kind of the same sort of stuff you're dealing with no matter where you buy in, in this arena. Um, so for the most part, yes, it's, there's some learning involved in that, but, uh, you know, anyone that knows the area could be a good, um, point of reference. I've met a lot of people who I run things by and say, Hey, what do you think about this property? And they'll give me some feedback. You know, you said something there that I think is pretty important just to to highlight is that, it, a lot of people think that if they buy a property and it doesn't work out, they're going to be devastated. It's it's going to ruin them, ruin them. But you bought that property and it didn't work out and you just sold it. Did, did you, did you lose any money on it or like, how did that work <laughs> this out? Is, uh, yeah. This is what I always try to tell people. I have a lot of people ask me, you know, what are your questions about 
how I do this and things like that. When I, you know, the biggest thing is the fear, right? You don't want to, I don't want to lose money. I don't want to buy the wrong property. And I always tell them, look, if you break it down, let's say you buy a hundred thousand dollar property. Let's say you buy a $50,000 property, which I'm buying right now. It's Mm $55,000. And let's say I buy it and it goes South real fast. It's in a bad area. And however, I've remodeled it and put a renter in there for $1,500 a month. If I go and let's say I want to sell it, do you think an investor is going to pay less than $55,000 for that? You know what I mean? No, right. And right. let's say the market crashes and I have to fire sale it for 20% less than what I bought it for. Okay, so I'm out what? $10,000? Right. I mean, that's not going to change my life. So I always tell people, what can you afford to lose? You're not going to lose everything. I mean, I just don't see how that right. could possibly happen. And in the case of that property in Arizona, one of the only few properties I've sold I made about a hundred thousand dollars off it. So it wasn't to me, it was, you know, I was totally fine with that. So you made a hundred thousand dollars on a property that didn't work out. Yeah. I bought it for about <laughs> three twenty and sold it for four fifty. Wow. So, you know, so it, was, it, it worked out. I was I like, mean, hey, right. Yeah. It worked right, out great. Yeah. Now, again, there were some factors there. The market was picking up, but even now where it's, you know, it, you've got the interest rate situation. If you buy right and you buy a $60,000 house, you're going to be able to sell it if you have high rents in there. Yeah. That is more than a 1% rule because everyone's looking for those. Yeah, yeah. I, I really think that's a, a big advantage to lower price properties is that yeah. there's really kind of a floor like uh, on how how low it can go. Right. So. And I mean, on top of that, it's more scalable because you're talking lower barrier to entry. You know, that's how mm-hmm. I'm able to buy so much. It's not a $500,000 uh, $500, house, which are a couple streets over from these properties I'm buying, you know, which are, that's a lot more risk involved there, Mm -hmm. but it's in a quote, nicer neighborhood. Um, I'm targeting the properties that are just 50 to a hundred thousand dollars, you know? Um, right. So, you know, and, uh, more affordable. So if stuff tanks in the housing market, well, everyone's going to be pushed down and looking for affordable housing. So how can you lose? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I I think it's a great, great strategy that, that you're, you're doing here with your rentals. Well, let's take a look at at your numbers and see how everything works out. So when you add up your total rents for your entire portfolio, how much do you bring in every month? So right now, about the past three months, it's 140,000 to 145,000 a month. Okay. Depends on vacancies and uh, what we're doing. You know, I'm always changing things up and like right now I'm doing housing conversions, uh, adding bedrooms and things like that. Okay. So 140,000 okay. Okay. average for now. 100, 140 is a good average. Okay. And then how much are your mortgage payments? Okay. So, um, I own some of these properties, uh, outright, but if uh, you were to tally up, uh, principal interest, um, taxes, uh, insurance, uh, it comes in around 53,000 a month. Okay. And then do you pay any utilities? Yes. So on most of these properties, I am responsible for the trash water sewer. Um, that comes in around 9,500 a month, roughly. Okay. And then if we were to lump everything together, they, they, you know, you've got people that are helping you out. You've got, uh, I'm sure you've got rehabs going on repairs. How much do you think you spend in a month on just everything else? Yeah, so I have um, fixed costs. So I have staff that uh, maintenance in each city that, you know, we have our full-time maintenance staff plus admins to help run it and then the cost of materials. Uh, right now, it's, if you were to look at the average, about 43000 a month. Okay. Um, but again, that there's a lot of variables in there that I can control when I need to if I want to turn it up or down, uh, basically. Right, okay. So you've got... About one hundred and forty thousand in rent, depending on vacancy and how things are looking that month. Your mortgage is mortgages are fifty three thousand. You've got ninety five hundred in utilities, and then about forty three thousand for everything else. So you, on average, have about thirty four thousand five hundred in cash flow. Yeah, that's awesome. That is really awesome. Yeah. And how much time would you say that you spend, say, in an average week on managing everything? 
Well, again, I am highly motivated right now to streamline and automate our operations. So a lot of my time during the week is spent on that and assisting staff with situations that they might not understand. Um, probably if I'm sitting at my desk, you know, three to four hours a day, but I'm also buying property. So there's a lot of time that goes into that. Um, mm. Once I dial it back, it's definitely, I can spend maybe an hour or two uh, a day. Like I was in Spain for a month and I didn't really do much at all for a whole month. So, so you've got flexibility. I mean, you, you definitely can, flexibility. Yeah. That's, that's the key here. And the whole purpose of why I set it up this way was for the flexibility. That's what it's all about. That's why we're buying rental properties for freedom and flexibility and to have a better life. And Scott, it sounds like you've got that all figured out. Congratulations. If Scott inspired you and you're ready to buy your first rental property or you want to add to your portfolio, reach out to our sponsor, Shaley Ridge. She's a nationwide lender and she specializes in helping investors finance rental properties. She literally has tons of different loan programs and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you want to set up a time to talk to Shaylee or maybe even have her look at a deal that you're thinking about buying, you can reach out to her at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com, NMLS 42056. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. Make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button. I put out a new interview every single Tuesday. And if you're following the show, you'll get notified as soon as each episode comes out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.